And now, the season premiere of Patrick H. Willems. Where am I? How long have I been here? What year is it? Time flows past me like a river. The numbers tick higher and higher, yet I stay in the same place. I realize now, it's 2020. Only two weeks since 2019. The year of that weird Sonic the Hedgehog design. The year Pikachu wore a little hat. The year of the Jellicle Cats. Okay, I'm back from vacation. I've got a headache and a sunburn. Everyone else has moved on to 2020 and published their best of lists weeks ago, but I don't care. I'm still hung up on 2019, so you know what? I'm gonna talk about it. The world is on fire, figuratively and literally in the case of Australia. I'm not joking, it's really serious and horrifying. And it's in the mid 60s in New York in January. It's all scary and bad, but you came here to hear me talk about movies and pop culture, the only things I'm remotely qualified to voice an opinion on. So here we go. It was a year of transition for the monoculture. And by monoculture, I mean those rare pop culture properties so huge it seems everyone cares about them. The three biggest serialized stories of the past decade all came to some sort of an ending. Obviously, these are The Sexy Dragon Show, The Superheroes That May or May Not Be Cinema, and The Space Wizards Movies. This is really a topic that maybe I should do a video about, but we can learn some lessons from how they turned out. The general consensus is that Endgame was a satisfying ending, and Game of Thrones and Star Wars were not. I agree with this. With Rise of Skywalker in particular, there was a lot of talk about how the problem was that there was no plan. That this whole series should have been planned from the beginning. But see, with Game of Thrones, they did have a plan. They knew where it was going. The problem is that even if you know the ending, you can't rush past the steps to get there. If you want it to be satisfying, you need to do the work to earn those dramatic beats and character arcs. You can't just skip to the end. And that's what they did. Some of this could also be said for The Rise of Skywalker, Cough, Kylo Ren's Redemption, Cough. Endgame is a great counterpoint to Rise of Skywalker. The reason Endgame worked isn't because Marvel planned it all out from the beginning. Because they didn't. It worked because the storytellers were, essentially, good at improv. They yes-anded, acknowledging and building on everything that came before, whether they be plot points or character arcs, so the ending felt earned. Rise of Skywalker did the opposite regressing and contradicting the previous installment, valuing familiarity and nostalgia over growth and meaning. It didn't feel like an ending to the story that was being told. Obviously, ending long-running stories is hard, and this year was a great lesson in what to do and what not to do. In a piece on Rise of Skywalker for Vox, Emily Vanderwerf had a great observation about the current state of many blockbuster movies. She writes, Blockbusters are no longer developed, they're reverse engineered from previous successes. Does this system ever yield good movies? Sure, plenty of them. One benefit of the reverse engineered blockbuster is that it's rare for a truly terrible one to make it to the screen. Most fall somewhere between pleasantly mediocre and pretty okay. But it's also rare for a blockbuster to be genuinely great, though it does happen, as with films like Black Panther and The Last Jedi. The majority of blockbusters are defined less by what they try to say, and more by what they try to give you, which is exactly what they think you want. A smorgasbord of the things you loved from earlier movies, sandwiched tightly together in the same place, so you can gawk at them for a few moments, and then move on to the next exhibit. 
I've been thinking about this and its connection to the declining movie theater attendance of the past decade or so. In general, people only venture out to the theater for big spectacle-driven blockbusters, which are the reverse-engineered machines Vanderwerf was talking about, which largely are… fine. And yeah, I made the video talking about the pleasures of pretty good movies, but it becomes an issue when pretty good movies are all someone watches. Look, I really, really hate to dredge up the whole Martin Scorsese Marvel debate, but there's a key line in his op-ed for the New York Times that I want to highlight here. Scorsese says, If you're going to tell me that it's simply a matter of supply and demand and giving the people what they want, I'm going to disagree. It's a chicken and egg issue. If people are only given one kind of thing and endlessly sold only one kind of thing, of course they're going to want more of that one kind of thing. I mentioned this in a Q&A video recently, but I'll say it again. I think the cause of so many of these deranged, toxic fans who are still screaming about The Last Jedi or Captain Marvel or whatever they're mad about now is that they only go see like four movies per year. They put all their energy into a small handful of franchises and then lose their minds when those franchises don't give them exactly what they want. Go see more movies! There are so many good ones! Instead of yelling about how you want R-rated superhero movies because you're an adult, just go see actual movies made for adults. If you liked Joker, or if you hated Joker, you'll probably still like Uncut Gems. You know why? Because it's a much better movie. And that's the thing. Not only are there way more options than a handful of franchises, there's an overwhelming amount of options. It's going to be weird with these big monocultural series ending, because they were pretty much the only thing everyone was united in watching. There are so many movies and TV shows and YouTube things and podcasts that everyone consumes a wildly different diet of media. Our viewing is more fractured than ever. I find that I constantly end up in conversations where, instead of talking about stuff we're both watching, all we do is recommend different things that the other isn't watching. The exception, sort of, is a small handful of TV shows. I'm not the first to make this observation, but this felt like the year that the binge-watching model that Netflix pioneered finally died. Or at least we got proof that it's not ideal and is not going to be the main way we consume TV shows from now on. Look at how long Game of Thrones and Succession and Watchmen and The Mandalorian were able to stay at the forefront of pop culture discussion. Months for each of them, and that's because they were released week to week, so everyone was on the same page at the same time and spent seven days discussing each episode. Sure, Stranger Things is super popular, and it's nuts how fast people jumped on those ice cream sailor costumes for Comic-Con cosplays, but everyone had watched that and moved on in, like, one weekend. Another thing I want to say about movies. What does give me some hope are the successes of quality movies for adults. You know, the kind of movies that Hollywood seems to stop making? Knives Out is a huge hit. Hustlers and Ford v Ferrari and Us and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood all made over $100 million domestically. That's kind of a big deal. And then there's Joker. Look, I don't like Joker. I don't think it's a good movie, but its success is insane. It's one of the most profitable movies ever? So it's going to have some kind of an impact. This could go one of two ways, I think. The good way is that studios, which are obviously going to keep making comic book movies, will stop trying to copy the Marvel formula and start giving modest budgets to filmmakers hopefully more interesting than Todd Phillips to make standalone films with their own unique take on the characters. The bad way, which is what will probably happen, is that we just get a bunch of R-rated supervillain movies that are edgy for the sake of being edgy, and they'll probably make lots of money. Also, I'm pretty curious what the end of the big monocultural series means for film YouTube, this little landscape on the internet that I reside in. So much of this genre or field or whatever you want to call it is dominated by videos about Marvel, Game of Thrones, and Star Wars. They're the three topics that people can always fall back on for guaranteed views. Obviously, these properties aren't fully done, but hey, maybe this means people are going to start branching out and covering different stuff. I hope 2020 is the year video essays on Little Women become the big thing on YouTube. We've got enough ones about Marvel movies. Okay, that covers movies and TV. What else we got? Comics. 
I am truly spectacularly behind on comics. Here's a picture of my to-read pile. And since I'm so far behind on ongoing series, I haven't gotten around to reading any original graphic novels this year. There is so much I missed, and as much as I love keeping up with single issues, every year there are so many smaller titles and indie publications that I just don't get to. We usually say this about TV and movies, but it applies to everything. I'll say it here, even though it uses that word that I hate so much. There's too much content. I mean, I don't want it to stop, but there's way too much for anyone to keep up with it all. Unless you are my friend and podcast co-host, Scott Thomas, who has the superhuman ability to keep up with everything. Scientists will spend decades trying to figure out how he does it, and I doubt they will ever succeed. But since there's so much, all we can do is be more discerning and selective and focus on the stuff that really matters to us. With comics, I need to get better about only reading the titles that I really love, so I can have more time for the great stuff that I've been missing. Books. Uh, none of the books that I read in 2019 were published in 2019, so let's move on. Music. Look, I'm old and finding new music is hard and time consuming, so yes, Taylor Swift was my number one artist on Spotify for 2019, because what else am I gonna do? Not listen to Paper Rings a hundred times? Come on! Video games. You think I have time to play video games? Next category. Sports. Sp sports? What's going on right now? The Democratic Primary. Okay, stop it. Let's just get to the list. And now, like every year, here's my weird, not really ranked list of my 50 favorite things from 2019. But first, here are the things that I didn't get around to before making this video. Okay, let's go. The Year of Keanu. The Return of Eddie Murphy. The Triumphant Return of J.K. Simmons as J. Jonah Jameson. My Giant Lego Batmobile. Unraveled Live, The Perfect Poké Rap, the best internet video of 2019. Galaxy's Edge at Disneyland. Netflix finally getting better at putting movies in theaters. At least, in New York. Baby Yoda. Not The Mandalorian, just Baby Yoda. My two podcasts. I'm being selfish there. San Diego Comic-Con. Genuinely a really fun time. All right, now my favorite comics of 2019. House of X and Powers of Ten, joint entry, by Jonathan Hickman, Pepe Larraz, and R.B. Silva. Superman's Pal Jimmy Olsen, by Matt Fraction and Steve Lieber. Criminal, by Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips. Smashed, by Junji Ito. Now my favorite TV of 2019. Succession, The Righteous Gemstones. Watchmen, Barry. Really good year for HBO. I Think You Should Leave. Fleabag. Documentary Now. Chernobyl. Catastrophe. John Mulaney and the Sack Lunch Bunch. The unauthorized Bash Brothers Experience, counting the movie and the album together, jointly one of my absolute favorite things of the year. Okay, and now my 25 favorite movies of 2019, not fully ranked, but divided into sections. Numbers 21 through 25, in no specific order, Pain and Glory, Us, High Flying Bird, Booksmart, The Lighthouse. Numbers 11 through 20, in no specific order, Dolomite is my name, Ford v Ferrari, A Hidden Life, Terry's Back, John Wick Chapter 3, Parabellum, Toy Story 4, Avengers Endgame, The Beach Bum, The Farewell, Joint Entry, Cats and Serenity, Two of my most memorable movie experiences I had all year, and I'm stealing that move from Ethan Alter. Midsummer. Okay, numbers 6 through 10, in no specific order. We've got Knives Out, Ad Astra, Hustlers, Portrait of a Lady on Fire, The Irishman, and my top five movies of 2019, again, in no specific order. Parasite, Marriage Story, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Uncut Gems, Little Women. Man, what a good year for stuff. I've been trying to think of an accurate metaphor for my weird career making internet videos. The best one I've found is a swimming race. 
You're working as hard as you can to keep moving forward, but you can't really see your surroundings. You don't have time to change your approach or technique, and if you stop, you'll drown. And by drown, I mean stop making money. And when I look at my work from 2019, it feels more like 2018 Part 2. A bit bigger and better, more polished, but more of the same. YouTube is supposed to be all about consistency, finding a successful formula and sticking to it. But I don't want that. I want to feel like this is going somewhere and moving forward and evolving. I want a real sense of progress and getting closer to where I want to be. And looking back over the videos from the past year, sure, they're pretty good, but I'm not sure how much progress there really was. So this year, there's gonna be some goddamn progress. I have some plans for the year, like, I think pretty big, cool plans. Here's some of what you can expect. So that's the plan for the year. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, it's a bit more elaborate than I expected. Uh, hey, uh, how was your vacation? Did you finally get a chance to relax? Maybe see a parrot? It was fun. Yeah, but like, what did you do? Did you do any cool stuff? Did you see maybe like a stingray? Jesus, Jake, I don't want to talk about it. Because we are boring my new friend. I had meant to ask you about that. The coconut? This is Charl. Charl? Charl. It's like Charles, but singular. I felt like we needed some new supporting cast members. But you already have us. And now we have Charl. I think audiences are going to love him. Here, you fellas get acquainted. I have somewhere to be. At 11 p.m.? Yes. What is happening? Well, I mean, you know Pat. He's the only guy that can go on vacation and come back <laughs> more high-strung. <laughs> no, like... Like, what is happening? What do you mean? What do you mean? So I just got back from vacation, where I went to some cool places and saw some cool stuff, and probably should have made a cool travel video, but I didn't. And now I wish I had because I was watching Oliver Astrologo's class, video editing, transforming footage into evocative travel stories on Skillshare. This class covers shooting good footage while traveling and then various techniques for editing it into really exciting, polished videos. You can check out this class or thousands of others by joining Skillshare, an online learning community with classes on music, video production, animation, cooking, like, there's a lot of stuff. I use it a lot, especially for After Effects, so I genuinely recommend it. Join now for two free months of a premium membership by clicking the link in the description. That gives you unlimited access to as many classes as you want. Again, two free months by clicking the link in the description. So kick off 2020 by learning some cool new skills. And plus, it helps to support this channel. All right, welcome to a new year and a new season. I want to thank Devin from Legal Eagle for helping me shoot the opening scene. He has one of my favorite channels on YouTube, and you probably already watch it, but if not, go check it out. There should be a button up there. We have a lot of big stuff planned for this year, and if you want to help us make it happen, and also get exclusive access and announcements, sign up for our Patreon. You can listen to my two podcasts, The Infinity Podcast and Can't Get Enough of Keanu, available on all places that you get podcasts. New episodes every week. You can follow me on all those social media platforms to, I don't know, see whatever I'm up to or thinking about. And I'll be back here in a couple weeks. Bye.